Robert Fulton and the Steamboat, 1765 to 1815. After the purchase of Louisiana, thousands of settlers joined the ever-swelling tide of westward migration which had been set in motion by the early pioneers. These frontiersmen had made their way across the mountains either by forest trail, leading with them their pack horses, or, a little later, by the rough road cut through the forest, their household goods packed on a strong wagon drawn by oxen or horses. Already this difficult method had given place to the flat boat, which, though safer and more convenient, was still unsatisfactory except when it floated downstream. In the early years of this century, therefore, the increasing demands of migration and traffic turned many inventive minds to the problem of applying steam power to river navigation, in the hope of accomplishing a speedier means of travel and transportation. The first to achieve success in inventing and bringing into practical use a steam-driven boat was Robert Fulton. Robert Fulton was born of poor parents in 1765 in Little Britain, Pennsylvania. His father having died when the boy was only three years old, his mother took charge of his education. She taught him herself until he was eight and then sent him to school, but he had no liking for books and made slow progress. Drawing and mechanical devices absorbed his interest, and nothing gave him greater delight than to visit the shops of mechanics, and there with his own hands to work out his new ideas. It is said that Robert came into school late one morning, and upon being reproved by his teacher, explained that he had been at a shop beating a piece of lead into a pencil. At the same time he exhibited the pencil, and remarked, It is the best that I have ever used. Upon examining it, the schoolmaster was so well pleased that he praised Robert's effort, and in a short time nearly all the pupils were using the same sort of pencil. His ingenious ideas found expression in other ways. For example, it was the custom of his town to celebrate the 4th of July with an illumination with candles, but one year, the candles being scarce, the citizens were requested to omit the usual display. Robert was at this time only thirteen years old, and like the other boys of his age, full of Fourth of July patriotism, which had to be expressed in some extraordinary way. So he set his busy brain to work, and having bought gunpowder and pasteboard, produced some homemade sky rockets, which greatly astonished the community by their mid-air explosions. Such fireworks were at the time entirely new to the people of the town. Another illustration of his inventive gift belongs to his boyhood days. He and one of his playmates used to go out fishing in a flat boat, which they propelled by the use of long poles. Getting tired of this method of navigation, Robert made two crude paddle wheels, one for each side of the boat, connecting them by a sort of double crank which the boys united in turning. They could then easily propel the boat in their fishing trips to various parts of the lake, and keenly enjoyed this novel and easy way of going a-fishing. While still young, Robert won the warm regard of a great painter, Benjamin West, whose father was an intimate friend of Robert's father. Very lightly this friendship turned Robert's mind strongly towards painting. At all events, the desire to become an artist took so strong a hold upon him that at the age of seventeen he went to Philadelphia and devoted his time to drawing and painting. Here he remained three years and painted with such skill that he not only supported himself, but sent money to his old home and saved four hundred dollars with which he bought a little home for his mother. In time his interest in art led him to go to London, where he studied under Benjamin West, but very soon he became interested in trying to improve canal navigation and in working out various mechanical appliances. This love for invention finally diverted his attention very largely from painting and led him to the work which made him famous. 
when about thirty years old he went to paris to experiment with a diving boat an invention of his own intended to carry cases of gunpowder under water this machine was not successful but by the spring of eighteen o one a little more than three years after his first effort he had constructed another diving boat and went with it to brest where he gave it a successful trial with three companions he descended twenty-five feet below the surface of the water and remained for one hour in eighteen o five he tested it again in england where with a torpedo of a hundred and seventy pounds he blew up a vessel of two hundred tons for the invention of the torpedo boat the world is indebted to fulton but for the first successful steamboat it owes him a debt of deeper gratitude before leaving paris fulton became acquainted with robert r livingstone who was at that time the american minister to france mr livingstone had long felt an interest in steamboat navigation and was willing to supply fulton the necessary money a steamboat constructed at paris was finished by the spring of eighteen o three and the day for its trial trip was at hand when early one morning the boat broke in two parts and sunk to the bottom of the river the frame had been too weak to support the weight of the heavy machinery on receiving the news fulton hastened to the scene of his misfortune and began at once the work of raising the boat for twenty-four hours without food or rest and standing up to his waist in the cold water he laboured with his men until he succeeded in raising the machinery and in placing it in another boat but the exposure to which he submitted himself brought on a lung trouble from which he never fully recovered having discovered the defects of the machinery fulton returned in eighteen o six to america where with money furnished by his friend livingstone he began to construct another steamboat which he called the clermont after the name of livingstone's home on the hudson this boat was a hundred and thirty feet long and eighteen feet wide with a mast and a sail and on each side a wheel fifteen feet in diameter fully exposed to view one morning in august eighteen o seven a throng of expectant people gathered on the banks of the north river at new york to see the trial of the clermont everybody was looking for failure people had all along spoken of fulton as a crack-brained dreamer and had called the clermont fulton's folly of course the thing would not move that any man with common sense might know they said so while fulton was waiting to give the signal to start these wiseacres were getting ready to jest at his failure finally at the signal the clermont moved slowly and then stood perfectly still just what i have been saying said one onlooker with emphasis i knew the boat would not go said another such a thing is impossible said a third but they spoke too soon for after a little adjustment of the machinery the clermont steamed proudly up the hudson as she continued her journey all along the river people who had come from far and near stood watching the strange sight when the boatmen and sailors on the hudson heard the clanking machinery and saw the great sparks of fire and the volumes of dense black smoke rising out of the funnel they thought the clermont was a sea monster in their superstitious dread some of them went ashore some jumped into the river and some fell on their knees in fear believing the day of judgment to be at hand one old dutchman told his wife that he had seen the devil coming up the river on a raft the trip of a hundred and fifty miles from new york to albany was made in thirty-two hours success had at last rewarded this man of strong common sense quiet modesty and iron will the clermont was the first steamboat of practical use ever invented from that time men saw the immeasurable advantage to trade of steam navigation on lakes and rivers this was fulton's last work of great public interest he died in eighteen fifteen having rendered an untold service to the industrial welfare of his country and the world End of chapter twenty